I'm going to do uh, simultaneous measurements with a very nice expensive one, a fluke. And then I also have myself a $10 Craftsman one that I picked up uh, just for this video, so you're welcome. And we're going to work with both of these side by side. So the first thing I'm going to do is just give a quick comparison between the two, um, denote um, how to properly use them and why someone would pay 150 to 400 for a fluke multimeter. Um, here's a different fluke one um, that, uh, that works and why uh, if you just want to measure a couple things it's okay to get one of these. It's really not a big deal especially if you're just starting out or if you want to do a couple measurements maybe you're installing a ceiling fan and you're not quite sure whether that breaker is really off or not. Um, I've seen breakers that show off and still uh, have power flowing through them so I'm going to open this one and then we're going to do a quick comparison and then we're going to get straight to it. Alright so with this small time meter uh, the one thing to notice is, and, and this is really indicative of all um, economical or cheap meters, is that they uh, have what seems to be more options if you're not familiar with what you're looking at. Because you look at this more expensive one here, and it looks like, hey, okay, it's it's less words, and you know perhaps it does different functions, but it's simpler, right? Maybe it doesn't do as much. And then you look at this one, and you look, wow, look at all these different ranges. Look what it can do. Well this meter doesn't automatically zone in or automatic range what voltage you want to measure. You have to know that somewhat ahead of time. You're not going to damage it, it just won't give you a correct reading. That's all, that's all the, the difference as far as why this one has between 600 and 200 uh, millivolts and you know this one here when it comes to measuring DC take a look, it just says V it doesn't say uh, anything else but that. So that's an important uh, reason why you may pay more for uh, one of these meters. It's just because you don't have to uh, play around with it. For the most part, if you're just using a multimeter, for example, you're installing a ceiling fan or you're replacing a power outlet or a receptacle, you know, these work pretty well. Um, if you're looking for more precise measurements, obviously um, this might not be the way to go. If you're uh, thinking about using the multimeter a lot, not just uh, once every you know, month or so, then uh, definitely want to make sure you probably grab yourself one that's a bit more industrial. Um, this, for example, may not be as efficient in using the batteries that you put in, so this may only last a couple hundred hours, maybe this will last, the other one lasts even more. This one may not have auto shutoff. Certainly the ratings for electrical properties, resistance, how much current it can hold aren't going to be as um, uh, high as something like this. In fact, you can, you can tell for example right here, this is a category 2, okay? Uh, when we look at this meter here, um, it's talking about a category 4 and a category 3 depending on uh, what voltage level you're dealing with, 600 volts or 1000 volts. Again, this is a, a, the $10 economical version. Um, you basically, if you want to measure voltage DC, direct current, for example, you want to measure battery voltage, then you would turn to, for example, up to 20 volts and you would measure it. And you would connect the COM, this is the central one, and since you're measuring voltage, resistance, maybe you want to measure the internal resistance of a battery. Maybe you want to measure the resistance of a wire or you want to see if the wire is broken, this is where you would go for something like this. If you want to measure resistance of a resistor, there again, that's what you would use that for. This test the diode also beeps when there's connectivity. This one outputs voltage, so this is why this requires a 9 volt battery. In order to properly test uh, the um, diode, uh, you need that. Um, this one has a built-in feature specifically to test a 9 volt battery or a 1.5 volt battery. It's possible that this multimeter could be putting a small load on these and potentially giving a more accurate reading than for example moving it up to you know 2 volts over here. Um, I don't know, we, we can check that later. Now the reason why that's gray is right here. Saying if you want to measure current, you keep calm where it's at but you move the voltage, ohm, and milliampers to here. And the reason why there are two basically has to do with the way it's fused. With these two connected and you're measuring something like a battery or uh, small circuits, 
Uh, maybe you're trying to measure a fuse, that's fine. Or you're measuring a small circuit with power on, that's what you need current for, right? Then this is okay, but if you take a close look, you need to read because what it says here is 200 milliamp max, right? That's 0.2 amps max that it can take where you'll blow the fuse out and this won't work. If you want to measure uh, current that's higher than that, up to 10 amps, then you need to use the COM and the 10 amp here. You need to con disconnect from here and connect to here. This 10 amp has an internal fuse and the circuitry for this 10 amp should be as separated away from the uh, microprocessor and the internals as possible so that way if this blows it doesn't affect the multimeter, it doesn't play with this because there's so much current running through, it doesn't destroy it. That's why they're separated here. Okay. Now for comparison when we're dealing with amperage, uh, this one you would you would turn to milliamp, and if we uh, zoom in real quick, uh, we can see again we connect the com here just like we did with this one. So this one had the com here. Uh, so for this multimeter, when we're talking about measurements, com here, milliamp here, anything greater than 200 milliamp, you would need to use this one. This is again just if you're measuring current and be very very cautious about uh, keeping consistent with these readings. This is 10 amps for 30 seconds max. Okay, And uh, this basically states that uh, don't just continue to leave this measuring current and think that it's okay for a half hour. You're going to blow this and potentially blow this entire thing uh, just because it's cheap and I'm not sure how much I would trust, really how much I would trust putting 10 amps in this. That is a lot of juice. At any rate, when we go to here, this fuse portion up to 400 milliamps. Now this doesn't make it better because the other one was 200 milliamps and this is 400 milliamps. It's just the way that this is designed. And again, you see that there's a 10 amp here, up to 10 amps max. Now if there's no time on here, that's something you need to look at the manual for. Just because there's no time doesn't mean that you can put 10 amps through this all day and all night and expect that uh, it's, it's not going to be uh, an issue. Because 10 amps again is a lot of juice. The 400 milliamp, or the, the, the small milliamp rating in our economical version, as well as our voltage and our resistance reading were all combined in one, okay? And the high current was separate. With this uh, multimeter, again, this is a bit more expensive one, we see that they have um, completely separated the circuitry to measure milliamps, amps, voltage currents and diodes. So they've, they've separated them, again, probably more for uh, numerical finesse. You want to make sure that you get better resolution and to do that sometimes it's just better to, and easier to separate the circuitry. So uh, that's the difference there. One other difference that I uh, should mention is that the probes are certainly going to be different. Uh, in addition to having different category rating, um, the wires, for example, may not be as great quality. The tips may be of just, um, may have nickel or some type of metal on there that can easily chip and, in the, you know, that could affect uh, readings later on if it starts to peel. Whereas if you have uh, a bit more um, expensive probes, uh, you may not experience that. For example, these probes right here, they're category 3 for 1,000 volts and category 4 for 600 volts. And this, these can handle 15 amps max. So uh, just a word of caution, if you're going to uh, play around, uh, make sure that whatever probes come with the multimeter, you go that one. You wouldn't want to switch these probes, throw them on this multimeter, and then expect the same performance. Um, you would notice, uh, you know, it may be even detrimental. Uh, since these are uh, category 3 and these can be cat up to category 4 of a thousand volts these can only handle 600 volts so don't mix and match they're not like uh, shoes and outfits at any rate so here we go we're gonna do something simple we're gonna first we're gonna measure battery so batteries are DC so we're gonna take our uh, fluke we're gonna tell it we want to DC it says auto range hence why it's uh, partially more expensive for this one, since we're measuring a battery, we want to select the range. So we're going to say right around 200 millivolts or just 2 volts. And let's go ahead and measure it. So we've got our trusty industrial battery here. Move. 
There we go. Move my stuff from this. So it's reading right around 1.2, 1.7 volts. Flying back and forth a little bit. Now when I use my little fun one, let's take a look at how it performs. Again, I'm connecting the negative and here's the positive. The reason it shows 1,615 is because I showed or I selected 2,000 millivolt. If I raise that up to just between 20 volt, now I'm getting 1.62 volt. So you're not going to damage the multimeter if you go way over, right, or you go way under. It's not going to damage it. but your readings aren't going to look correct. And, and most of the time you can just feel like clearly my battery is not 1,613 volts. So there you go. So you can see the decimal point at uh, the 200. You can see the decimal point at the 20. The difference between these two is you get better resolution. If I want to measure up to 200 volts, you see that decimal point moves back. Measure conductance. I want to see if something is conductive. And you can do that a couple ways. Um, some of the readings actually make a tone. Uh, other ones you can just use the ohm. So I'm going to keep everything where I'm at since I'm measuring ohm and um, what I'm going to measure conductance of is a piece of tape and I know that sounds kind of odd but this is metallic tape and for a project I actually use this as a lead. I was making a circuit board and I cut out a couple patterns uh, since I was using low current and I was you know basically I was using this as a wire even though it's just you know fancy sticky tape so let's say you didn't know whether it was conductive because initially I didn't I thought maybe there was um, some type of plastic over this some type of polymer there you go very very low resistance so let's take a look if I put it on this tape it jumps a little bit but that's it so this tape is conductive so again I was able to use my multimeter for something um, that you wouldn't typically think hey let's see if my tape is conductive but indeed it is and as I said you can use this for leads for a circuit board if you want current to go around something you could use it for that anything you want since it's 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 very flexible now what about um, our craftsman over here what are we gonna how is this one gonna work well let's take a look since I'm measuring ohms I'm gonna just bring it down to 20k it doesn't matter again you're not gonna break if you go over or under but for our sake let's just move it to 20k the middle and then play around with whether we think it should go up or whether we should go down so we're gonna going to connect them right here. So if you want to get more specific, if you want to see more resolution, we can just move it down. Now we get a little bit more resolution. Now we get even more because we have there look where our period is at. So we see 1.0, 3.2. I mean, it's jumping around as I'm moving these leads because this isn't perfectly flat and and uh, for other such reasons, but adds for all really uh, intents and purposes, this is a conductive wire. People probably best know ohms for resistance and so what I have here is a resistor. I, I, I don't know the value of it so I just measure the value of it. Okay so instead of seeing zero now we're seeing one. So that means it's perfectly conductive, right? Well no because look we're at 200 ohm. Our resolution is wacky. It's w I mean, it, it's way too low. So let's move it up one. It says 1,000, but 1,000 what? So let's move it up to 20K. So it's between 0.99 and 1.0 kilo ohm. So it's one kilo ohm resistor. Now, um, we can certainly verify that by so it's already at the ohm reading. I don't know if that did anything. So let's go ahead and try it again. And I believe I was touching it before. So 1.002 kilo ohm, exactly what the other one stated. So perfect. Measuring resistors. 
All right, so let's measure um, the voltage with this guy, and we're going to use this one first. All right, so we've got our we've got our two probes. It doesn't matter since we're measuring AC, and it alternates back and forth between positive and negative, negative and positive. It doesn't matter which end you put in. What does matter, though, if you want accurate readings, is what setting you choose on here, since we're measuring voltage. Again, not current, so it stays where it's at. That's what the V is for. We're going to measure voltage, and in the US, voltage is 120, right guys? Voltage alternating current, and right around 200. That's what we would expect um, to be. It's going to be, you know, 120. So let's go ahead, let's plug them right in. Ugh. All right. And nothing. The really disadvantage is that you have to select your own. And if you're not paying attention, if you looked at this and you said voltage AC 200, I, I don't know that, you know, most people would say, oh, okay, that, that's, it's, it's dead. There's nothing in here. If they went to 600, then all of a sudden it's 121 volts. And to be frank, this is a problem. Okay. 200 volts. I don't think they should have used that system of metrics. Knowing that people are going to probably use this to measure uh, AC power of outlets, electrical receptacles, I think this was again a bad design on their part because a lot of people may assume, hey, it's 120 volt, this is 200 volt, right? It's greater, it should show, but it doesn't. Be very careful. Go up one more if you're not sure. Maybe worth getting one that maybe is mid-range, one that automatically selects the voltage so you're not guessing or you're not playing with it. So if on the safe side, always go a little bit higher just to make sure um, you know the number's not really low, so to speak, if it was over here and you're just seeing zeros padded to the left of that. That's what's happening basically here, right? It's 120, but the decimal point is here. So it's one, two zeros. So this would be point one two zero. I guess it just feels like it should not have to uh, you know, show anything. So that's not, I would say that this is a bad design. Bad design. Again, we're measuring voltage. So I'll put them in the voltage. We're measuring AC. It's auto ranging, so there's no threat of accidentally not selecting the right one. I should just be able to plug it right in. Let me try that again. And I'm going to get a good voltage from there. 120.1 volts. This one shows a little bit of resolution. It's more expensive. Now I mentioned that you know I wanted to show you how, what, what to use a multimeter for, and here's something that I found out the other day, and this is something that we can investigate together. I haven't done this yet. There's a switch on the wall that's over that yonder that if I turn it off, it turns the power off on this. Here's the interesting part though. This right here is a little light so I can see where I'm going so I don't have to stub my toe as often. And I have that switch off, and yet this is still partially on. It's clearly a wiring problem. So I'm gonna go and shut off this. And as I'm shutting this off, you can see what, this, uh, what the reading becomes because I was very surprised to see that. And this is why you would use a multimeter. The switch is off. 25.6 volt available. This switch is off and yet we're getting some serious voltage. Um, obviously this receptacle either needs to be replaced, there could be a grounding issue, the switch on the other side could have grounding issues. Um, this can cause you know issues not only with electronics uh, in general but also with safety. If um, Fluke and other companies, they make a, a probe tester to see if there's voltage and all it does is it lights up and goes bzzz or beeps or blinks. I have one myself. If I would have tested it on this outlet right here, it wouldn't have worked because it's too low. Yet, there you go, 25.6 volts of readily available. So this is why you would use a multimeter and this is why I always use a multimeter to confirm that there's nothing actually in here. Another option available is the continuity test. In a diode, current should only be flowing one way. If it flows the other way, we have uh, problems. Uh, the diode could be bad, for example. What I really like about this continuity test is that it makes noise. So it's like the ohm uh, 
operation in a sense, uh, but it, what it does is it introduces voltage into the probes, and if that voltage reaches zero, it makes a beep. So basically you have an audible signal rather than just having to read. Here and here and here and here and here. You don't have time to look at this each time. You can just sit there and listen. Actually, why don't we do that? Let's just probe the damn thing. All right, so let's move it to a continuity tester. Give it a quick test. Good multimeters, every single time you touch it, regardless of how long the duration, you should hear the beep. These cheaper multimeters, a lot of times, if you go too fast, it'll act like as if it didn't beep. We'll give that test a little later. I want to see if this is communicating with any other part of the board. I can... Okay, so this means that this point is, is, is connected. All right, so this means that this diode has somehow a direct connection or an indirect connection, but it's, and that's the advantage. I can go and quickly probe through a circuit board and test continuity. All right, continuity tester. So let's do what I've done with the other probe. Let's go quickly through this and see if we can... Do you hear that? Tolerance when it should beep and when not should beep perhaps is too wide, right? So it's not confident, statistically speaking, of course. And of course, that's it's gonna work. But if I went through and tested it real quick, may not catch it. Circuit analysis, probably not the best thing to do with this little guy right here. Now, resistance, as we spoke earlier, basically is the measure of how much voltage can go through. And it depends on the properties of a resistor, of the material, depends on the temperature, sometimes the pressure of whatever you're using. In this case, we want to measure how much current carrying ions, da 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 da, are in the water. So here's what we're gonna do. This is a fairly very easy basic test. Now I put different probes in here. I'm just gonna toss them right in and turn this ohm reading to where well, we can start getting some numbers. So 200 kilo ohm resistance. That's what it's currently at and it says 33 or 32 kilo ohm. So 32,000 ohms. Clear we're getting different readings. Uh, don't be alarmed. It all depends on, um, quite a bit of this depends on how far uh, the distance between the probes are, where the ions are. This is just tap water, so there's going to be some ions floating around in there, which means it's somewhat conductive. Now, when we put this guy in here, salt, what should we expect it to do, right? What, sh what, what should we expect the resistance to be? Well, I don't know what the resistance is going to be, but I do know one thing. I know that when we add salt to water, we're going to have basically what's called an electrolyte. And so what we basically have when we put some of this in there is that uh, uh, sodium and chlorine should disassociate, should break apart. And as a result of that, the sodium, which is conductive, it's a metal, should then be able to basically be a charge carrier and start allowing charge to flow back and forth because it can be literally moving back and forth between these probes. As we do that, we should start noticing the resistance of these guys going down. Now, it's not predictable how much down they're going to get. It doesn't matter. All we're going to do is just see if we can observe the resistance going down. A little salt water or a little salt. Now, it's not necessarily going to be immediate. I probably should mix that a little bit. Break the NaCl apart, and it will start carrying more current. I'm just putting more in right now to speed up the process. I'm uh, uh, It's kind of cold in here. here if I had hot water, this would, of course, be much, much better 
we can see that the fluke is now reading considerably less. Now it's at three, before it was at 18. And I may have to move this Craftsman down a notch to get better resolution. There we go. So it's not right about three. So now look at, we're about getting more consistent readings between the two. And that should make sense. As I'm disassociating the sodium and the chloride, it means that this is becoming more conductive. As it becomes more conductive, we should see that the resistance should reduce. Add a little bit more here. Again, I'm just trying to speed up the process. With a little bit of work on my part, uh, you can see that the resistance has dropped. Initially, this was showing 18 kilo ohms. Now it's around 1.6. This one was showing 30 kilo ohms. Now it's around 2.89. So now I'm just going to have a little fun. Now I'm going to be a little bad and I'm just going to pour a whole bunch in there. Let's just have a little extra fun. Doo, doo, doo. Really just pour it on there. That's nice. That's nice. That is nice. Now if I wanted, now if my goal was to try and to see how conductive I could get, the easiest way to do that is not to sit here and, and me to do all the mechanical work of breaking it apart. The easiest way would be to boil this. If I boiled this, whoo, it'd be conductive quick. Now I added a lot more salt in here. You can see the numbers are starting to decrease again um, more rapidly. Um, most of the salt is unfortunately is now collected at the bottom. <laughs> It's really late and I need to stay up because I want to finish this video. <laughs> this is horrible. So um, I'm going to try a little salt water. Maybe it's the cure all. Maybe it'll just make me stay awake and get this video done right for you guys. Probably going to be pretty disgusting. Oh, good lord. Mm. Basic chemistry. That reminds me. <clears throat> if your glands are ever swollen, this is not a multimeter tip, but if your glands are ever swollen, a little bit here, gargle salt water. When you're measuring uh, light bulbs and you want to check see if they work, you can really only do that with these guys because they have a filament that uh, goes up, zigzags its way across the other end and connects back down. So just like a wire, it has resistance and continuity. So uh, you could, for example, change it to the continuity and keep one end on the outside and the other from the down. And you notice that it apparently isn't enough for this continuity tester to go off. So we can move it to the resistance. So it's, it's about 26, 27 ohm. All this is telling us is that this light bulb still works. And I only mention this, for example, if you're not sure whether you should change the light bulb, maybe you change two or three of them and they uh, none of them worked or you're just curious. Whatever the reason is, it's another good reason to use the uh, uh, multimeter for. I'll try the continuity tester on this first, see if this one goes off. Yeah, sure enough it does. So it's saying 25 ohm, so it, within this range it's saying, hey, clearly there's a connection and, and that beep is going off. So I know that this light bulb works. Depending on what you would use this type of switch for, this could be a kill switch, an oh shit switch, a red switch, the button that you use to launch a nuke, whatever. But what if you didn't have the schematics for this? Maybe there's no writing or it was on there and you couldn't see um, how this was designed. My point is, what if when I press down, which ones connect or disconnect? How would you know for certain? Let's say you had to replace the switch with another one and you had 10 minutes to do it and you couldn't find the schematics. You have a multimeter, but you don't have the schematics. Does this close a circuit? 
does it open a circuit? How would you know? Well, you could spend probably 10, 15 minutes looking it up. Here they have potentially a model number that may help, but more than, a not, more than not, most likely you'll have these switches and you won't know exactly what the connections are. One of the ways that you can do this is to simply just set it to, you can set it to ohm, and you just start probing from a common point and see. So let's keep it up and let's test it out. So it's conductive there, not conductive there, not conductive there. So in other words, closed, open, open. All right, so now here's the audible, rather than just looking at the resistance. Closed, open, open. So that means that potentially these two, when this kill switch is activated, pot potentially these could disconnect and these two could connect. I don't know. But this far what we know is these two are connected, these two are not. So now let's kill it. Let's see if we can discover what just occurred inside here. Interesting. My once closed is now disconnected. No connection. No connection. So thus far what I can be certain of is that when this was open these two were connected, a closed circuit, these two were open circuit. So what I'm gonna try now is to go down to this one because I suspect that this is one set and this is another set. When it's open as it is right now, these two are connecting, these two are disconnecting. When it's closed, these two are disconnecting or an open circuit, this becomes a closed circuit or it's connecting just what I'm assuming and we can test that theory right now. I should hear uh, an audible noise if now these two are connected, if my theory is correct. And indeed that's exactly what's occurring. And I should not hear any noise on these two. They should be completely separate. So as expected. So in very short order uh, we were able to basically find out the internal schematics for this guy right here. I didn't need to look it up on Google, just simply by using uh, the continuity or the resistance reader. Um, you could also use, by the way, um, the resistance meter to test switches to see whether or not, if you're using a, a rocker switch, whether or not there's good connection. Maybe the switch is bad and there's a high resistance when you press a little bit, when you press harder on it. Uh, then there's uh, less resistance. Alright, so on this particular multimeter it has a 9 volt and a 1.5 volt uh, measurement option and I'm really quite curious to see if that's any if that reading is going to be any different than if I just go to my DC and I measure it that way. Um, I want basically what I'm trying to see if there is a load. If they put a, like a couple resistors in line and series to, to, to test whether because you can have a high voltage battery that appears to be high voltage but as soon as you pull current from it, as soon as you try and load it with a load, it fails. And that happens a lot with car batteries. Say 20 volts and uh, again line this up and I'm getting 1.62 volts roughly. Now I want to move it to the 1.5 volt and I want to see if I get uh, any different reading on that. So I'm getting a 1.555 volt. Alright, to make sure it's not me, I'm going to switch it back. So there seems to be a little bit of a difference. barely so potentially it could be putting a small load um, just to get maybe a bit more of an accurate reading so all of this basically means that this battery should be good to go for this next measurement I'm going to measure current now 
A couple warnings, and please don't fast forward this part, especially if you're just not sure of what I'm even referring to. Current is what kills people, not voltage. If you want proof of that, think of the time in winter when you're walking around and you get shocked, or you shock someone in return. That's 20 or 30,000 volts. Did you die? Current, on the other hand, will kill. And it only takes, I'm not mistaken, something like one or two. And that depends on the body chemistry. If you're lightweight, if you drank salt water like I just did, if you um, went exercising, if it's a humid day or not humid day, all of those can drastically affect um, how your body um, reacts to current. So uh, be careful. And uh, if you're not sure what you're doing, then don't do it because you don't want to um, get into an accident, you don't want to hurt yourself or get yourself killed um, because you didn't take appropriate steps to maybe ask a professional, ask someone who knows what they're doing. Another thing that I want to talk about real quick is this. In order to measure current, the multimeter isn't an accessory or isn't seen as alien to the circuit. It is quite literally part of the circuit. This means that the multimeter, when it's connected, will keep the circuit going. And if you disconnect the multimeter, the circuit should no longer work. That's how you know you're measuring current. And that's why you have to be so careful. Not only do you have to be careful not to touch the probes, um, or careful where you put the probes, especially if it's in a close quarters with um, high voltage or high current um, components, you also need to be careful because this multimeter may not support that rating. This is 10 amps, but very carefully, if you know, as I pointed earlier, it says only for 30 seconds max, and I wouldn't even go for that. Um, I have no idea what the amperage rating on that is. Um, the other thing is make sure your probes are also compatible to measure uh, the amount of current, and um, they should, if they're certified, um, the reading should say, so here it says CAT3 1000 volt, but let me take a look on this cable. This cable says 2000 volts, uh, 18 American wire gauge, uh, can work up to 80 degrees Celsius. This one's right at CAT3 1000 volt and at 10 amps. So this is telling us again, and that and that should make sense, right? It should make sense because if the multimeter can take 10 amps, certainly you would expect the probes to. If it was any lower, you have incompatibility where this can measure more, but these won't. All right, let me run through again what's happening. I have current traveling through that top black probe. This guy right here is traveling through here. It's going to, it's going to my multimeter which is currently set at 10 amps right now. And because we're measuring current, I have it in the gray one, which I showed earlier, that must be connected when you're measuring at 10 amps. And it's AC 10 amps. So we're connecting to the wall outlet. After that, I've got it connected to the red probe, which is double clipped with alligator clips to the main outlet. Then it's going through the toaster. It's coming back out again into the black connector. Finally, it's returning home through that screwdriver. This is why you don't give children screwdrivers because you can very easily stick it into a wall outlet. Ask my mom for details. So I'm going to turn it on. Notice not an issue so far. And what we're looking to do, again, is we're looking to measure current and keep in mind this is fairly dangerous. I do have live current as another live, so I have to be very careful. Those two are close, although they're separated. So um, just be cautious. Here we go. There we go. So right now, it's measuring 6.73 amps. So when someone has the toaster and the microwave on, it's very evident why a fuse can go out, especially these older homes that have a 10 amp fuse, you put a toaster on, you only have 3.3 amps left before the fuse blows.
and you can also notice that the resistance is increasing because these coils are getting hotter and hotter and hotter inside this toast and as those coils get hotter and hotter it increases resistance all six and six and three quarters amps are going through that multimeter this is why I encourage you not to use these cheaper multimeters because if an engineer in a different country makes it you can't verify whether the UL certificate is justifiable whether when they say up to a thousand volts or 10 amps whether that's really true or not I've read many stories where the people have used these cheap amps and they've run a test like this and the thing has blown or the probes have melted um, with this much current coming through here you know any of those situations can occur so right now we're at 6.86 amps um, my toast I can feel it Whew, definitely getting heat through here all that current that's making that toast possible is going through that multimeter and there we go we have successfully measured current hell of a lot better than uh, salt water. <laughs>